<laughs> Does your garage look like this? Well, let me show you how to turn it into this. DIY garage storage shelves. Well, hello, random YouTube people. Today, we're gonna talk about a subject I'm really excited about, decluttering the garage. And we're gonna declutter by creating custom garage shelving. These shelves hold the capacity to store 43 17 gallon totes. That's a lot of storage. Not only that, I'm gonna show you how to make multiple outlets so you can power all of your tools in your awesome workbench area. We're going to add a pegboard, a shop light with its own light switch. This is gonna be a tubular video. Be sure to stick around. Subscribe. Welcome random YouTube people to my workshop. And as you can see, it is messy. It's messy because I don't really have places to store all the things that I use on a frequent basis. So it just ends up cluttered on the floor. I have a four car garage and this is a double deep third car garage, which is awesome. But really it just ends up as a clutter space for all the things that I have because I don't really have any place to put them. So we're gonna solve that problem today by creating our awesome custom garage shelving. A lot of this stuff I use, a lot of this stuff I will use, but a lot of this stuff is just garbage. So I'm gonna fill up my truck with a load of things to goodwill and to take to the dump, and let's clear out this space so we have a space to work to build these shelves. Now that a space is cleared, we need a plan. I've drawn up a little sketch of what I think the shelves are gonna look like. I've taken a measurement from side to side, which in my case, this is about 13 and a half feet or 163 inches approximately. You're gonna to have to do custom measurements for your custom area because not all plans are gonna be exactly the same. And I'm gonna come off the wall about 30 inches. So we're gonna have 13 and a half wide, 30 inch deep shelves. And the reason for these specific measurements is because I want to be able to store these totes. These 17 gallon totes have a measurement of 18 by 27 by 12 and a half. So I wanted to make the shelves a little bit deeper than the 27 inches just to give me some wiggle room. And now as concerning the shelves vertical height of 12 and a half, I wanted to make sure that I could stack at least two high on the top shelf. And then on the bottom shelf, I wanted room to be able to store some taller objects. So I made, did the math and calculated the difference between the top area and the bottom area and how many other shelves that I could fit in there with a 12 and a half inch height. When you're doing your measurements, make sure you account for the thickness of the 2x4 and the thickness of the sheet of MDF that you'll put on top of the shelf so that when you're doing your measurements, you don't make it too small by accident. Be sure to make sure you account for the thickness of your shelves. And of course, lastly, I just measured the width of my current toolbox in case I wanted to put it in the middle just to make sure that it would fit between the shelf space. And that area would also be wide enough for us to back in our razor if we needed the space in our garage. Now that I have a plan in place, I'm going to start by finding the studs on the side wall. These shelves need to attach to the studs so that the weight can be borne on those studs instead of on the drywall. Now there's not a stud at the 30 inch mark, so that means I'm going to need to make sure I put multiple screws in the stud further back just so that this can bear the weight. Of course, going to mark what I find and where the studs are so we can move forward. And now on to building the shelves. I'm gonna start with the top shelf first so I can make sure that I get the correct distance down from the top of the ceiling. Because 163 inches or 13 and a half feet is a long distance, I'm gonna make two separate boxes, one for each side. Each box is gonna be half that width at about 81 and a half inches. I've already made the measurements for these two boxes, so I'm gonna go ahead and chop up the wood with my Ryobi miter saw. The wood I'm using is just regular old two by fours. So the structure of these shelf boxes is really pretty simple. It's just a giant rectangle. We're gonna have two long sides and then two short sides. The short sides are gonna sit inside the long sides. So you can see we're gonna make multiple cuts of that exact same length so we can use them as outside edges and center support beams. With all of this in mind, I'm going to need to cut about 28 of those edge and center pieces for all of the different boxes for my shelves. So I'm going to cut one piece at 27 inches long, and you can see I'm going to line it up to the edge of the board and then just make that same cut over and over and over again until I have about 28 beam post pieces. 
So I wanted to point out that one thing you're going to want to remember is that you need to compensate for the thickness of these 2x4s. I cut these center pieces at 27 inches each because the outside edges of them are an inch and a half each because that's how thick a 2x4 is. So to get my total 30 inches, I have my 27 inch post in the middle and then two inch and a half posts or beams on the other side. So that's a total of 30 inches between the two, or the three actually. With all of the pieces cut from my first box, I'm gonna use my dad who is master DIY himself to help me assemble these boxes. What we're gonna do is just line them up and make sure that they are square and then insert two screws in each place where the wood connects to the main post. So we're going to do this for each different section until we have a finished box. Now to avoid splitting your wood, it's a good idea to assemble this box on the floor, mark where your posts are going to be, and then move them away and pre-drill your holes with a drill, and then you can drive in your screws, and then you won't split your wood. The edge pieces here are most important, so I'm going to use a square to make sure that the long beam piece meets up squarely with the short piece before I drill my screws in. The screws that we'll be using for these shelves are three and a half inch deck screws. These deck screws have a T25 star bit pattern on them, which is really nice because then you won't have to worry about your impact driver stripping your Phillips head screws. These star bit pattern bits are really nice and they will drive into the wood very well and they will be very secure and strong and safe. Now that the two edge pieces are connected, we're gonna flip this shelf box up so that we can drill our screws down instead of to the side, which is much easier. If you're finding it hard to line up the two x four and hold it in place while you're drilling your screws down, go ahead and try using a clamp. If you'll remember, when we pre-drilled the holes, I drew with my pencil a line where the posts are gonna be. So it's really just as simple as lining up where we drew those lines and drilling our screws into our two x fours. So we're going to do this for each center piece of this box. Now I'm just going to flip it over and do the other side. Remember to pre-drill the holes on this side of the wood too before you drive your screws in. Now that the first shelf box is fully assembled, we're going to mount it. We are going to take a measurement from the top of the ceiling down to the top of the shelf. In my case, that's 25 and a half inches. Then we're going to measure the thickness of our MDF. And then we're going to measure the thickness of our 2x4. Then we're going to come down the thickness of the 2x4 and the MDF beyond the top of the shelf so that we can put a little support beam. And to save some time up and down the ladder, I'm just going to go ahead and draw a straight line all the way across the wall at that height so that when I mount the next box, I know exactly where to do it and I don't have to remeasure again. So this little support beam is just an extra piece of 2x4 I'm drilling into the wall so that we can put the shelf on top of it, especially if you are doing this yourself. It's easier to hold the shelf up under the wall and drill on the screws. And then I'm gonna make sure that these support beams are level so that the shelf will be level when I put it on top. Now we are about ready to mount our first box for the shelf. What we're doing here is lining up the shelf on the wall and we're going to find the studs and mark where the studs are gonna be on the actual box itself. So that when I'm up on the ladder holding up this heavy object, I don't have to get my stud finder out to find those studs, they will already be pre-marked on the box. Just pro tip there. All right, it's go time. I'm gonna stand on the ladder and pull up the box and I'm gonna hold it over my shoulder and rest it on those little support beams we added. You can see that my dad is holding up a piece of wood just to help support that weight so that it's not all on my shoulders as I drill this into the wall, into the studs that I found earlier. Now that the shelf has been attached to the back wall, I want to make sure that the side wall is level as well. You can see I have my level out and I'm just pivoting this up until it's level. And of course, remember that you drill into the studs on the side wall. Two of those three and a half inch long screws per stud will be a good way to hold this weight. Now that the shelf is up there and supported because we screwed it into the side wall, I'm gonna go back through and make sure that every single stud on the back wall is hit with two screws. Alrighty, one down. The first box is secure to the wall. I'm going to move the support beam so I can hang the next box. I didn't mention this before, but the center support beam I made extra long so we could go underneath both boxes so I don't have to hang two support beams in the middle. I just have to worry about moving the support beam from the side to the other side of the wall. Now I couldn't do any of this without my professional pointer. Now we are bringing up what's going to be the main front post, which is going to hold the weight from the front of the shelves as well. You can see in my case in the garage, there's a little lip from the concrete that is going to sit on top of because that concrete pokes out of the wall. So on this side, it's going to sit on top of that concrete 
and we're just holding it up and then bringing up our MDF so we can get a measurement so we know where to cut the top of this little post at. Now just pointing out at this stage, you can look at this MDF, it doesn't quite fit the whole 30 inches long. Well, a typical MDF sheet is four feet, which is 48 inches. If I were to slice that in half, that would only be 24 inches. If these shelves came off the wall 24 inches, we would be solid. We'd only have to have the Home Depot people slit it in half and we could just use one piece for two shelves. But in this case, because I need to come out 30 inches, I needed to buy quite a bit more MDF, which is the most expensive part of this project, just so that we could fill that 30 inch gap. Just wanted to bring that up while I'm here. Off screen, I went ahead and cut the top part of that post off and I'm now just attaching it to the shelf and making sure that it's level and snug with the concrete as well. Before I went any further on this project, I wanted to do my due diligence and make sure that two tuts did stack on top of each other on the top shelf with the MDF in place. And yes, it does. Going back to the design, you can see that I have four vertical front posts. I already installed the one on the left. I'm gonna go ahead and attach the one that's right next to it as well while I'm here to make sure I get everything lined up and that when I make my shelves below that, I get the correct measurements based off of this vertical post. So here I am installing that vertical post. I'm gonna put four screws in this time. Now I'm not going to use the same screws as I've been using to go into the wall. I'm going from one two by four into another. That's only three inches of thickness. So I need shorter screws. I'm gonna use the same kind of deck screws, but a two and a half inch version instead of a three and a half inch. And second vertical piece installed. While the MDF is up here, I'm just gonna go ahead and draw a line to know where I need to cut this thing. And now it's time to create the second box. We're not going to create it exactly the same size as the first because all walls are different. And just to make sure that it fits snugly, we're gonna hold up our new beams for the new box and measure exactly where they meet up against the existing box that we just mounted. Now gonna get that same measurement for the other beam, but in order to do that, we need to move this MDF out of the way. Just now holding up our second beam piece, making sure that it is level, and then we're gonna mark where to cut this. From here on out, we're going to repeat this process because we have three more boxes we need to create and mount. And so here we're kind of just making our own little assembly line. We're gonna mark where the center beams are gonna be and pre-drill the holes. And we're gonna create these boxes, assemble them and mount them. With box two complete, I'm just mounting the support beam on the right side so we can hang box two. Now mounting our second box exactly the same way we did the first box. The only difference is we're going to connect the two boxes together with some two and a half inch screws. To do that, we're gonna use some clamps to hold the boxes together, make sure it's level, and then drill the two boxes together with those awesome two and a half inch deck screws. Hitting each stud with two three and a half inch screws, making sure it's level, and the shelf is done. Now we're just removing the support beams and on to the next set of shelves. Taking our measurement so we know where to put our next set of support beams. Support beams installing. On to box three. You can see we're just mounting it the exact same way we've been doing the whole time. We're just going to make sure that it's connected to the front posts that are already installed and make sure that those are level. Box three secure. Now moving the support beam for box four. And just like box two, we're gonna hold up the beams for box four to make sure that we get the measurement to fit in this area nice and snug. Now box four install. Now I've said it before and I'll say it again, but you need to make sure that everything's level. Check your level along the way, make sure that everything is straight. First two rows of shelves are installed. Now we're just gonna remove those support beams because they're not needed anymore. Now we're going to install the vertical posts for the right side of the shelves as well. The next four boxes are gonna be quite a bit smaller, obviously, but I'm gonna start with the bottom shelves first and measure exactly how far I need to go up to fit some of the larger objects I wanna store underneath, like my shop vac. Since these next four boxes are quite a bit smaller, I'm just gonna have one vertical beam on the middle to support the weight. We'll just pre-assemble the first two boxes for the left side and then go install them. Now the install of the first shelf on the bottom, we're gonna make sure that it fits the shop vac underneath and then the next shelf that goes between them, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that we account for the thickness of the MDF on the bottom shelf so that we know that we can put the shelf in the right space in the middle with the shelf and the MDF on top of it, just to make sure that everything is all even and square and we'll still be able to fit our totes and the shop vac as well. And repeat for the other side. 
Now onto the MDF sheets that go on top of the shelf boxes. Now a typical MDF sheet comes in 48 inch width. So because my shelves are 30 inches deep, I had Home Depot rip it at 30 inches. That leaves me with an extra around 18 inches of extra MDF that I'm going to use for the other shelves. But for the top sections, I bought four different MDF sheets each have a 30 inch section for the top four boxes that we installed at the beginning. So I'm just measuring and cutting it to length so I can have two separate sheets up there on top of those shelves. Now I'm just throwing up the first two MDF sheets for the first top shelves on the left side. These are 30 inch deep and then I will take a measurement for the other side of the shelves to make sure that the next cut of the MDF sheet will fit perfectly in that area because it might not necessarily be exactly half. Just making the final MDF cuts for the rest of the sections for the top two shelves. And installing those two. Onto the bottom four shelves, I did not want to purchase four more sheets of MDF just so that I could get that 30 inch cut, which would have been nice, but I didn't want to spend that money. I'm going to use the extra pieces here and cut them so that I can use two different pieces of MDF to fill that gap area, which we kind of talked about earlier. I chose to put the larger 18 inch version towards the front of the shelves and the smaller 12 inch towards the back. Now I'm just going around and securing the MDF to the 2x4s with my awesome Ryobi 18 gauge nail gun, battery powered. This thing is freaking awesome. For now I'm just focusing my nail gun efforts on the top two shelves where the MDF meets together in the middle. Then I will go around later with my nail gun and nail all of the MDF to the shelves so that's nice and secure and it won't wobble or move on me. Now that all the MDF sheets are installed, I'm going to do one last thing here and install a vertical post between the two top shelves in the middle. This centered post is going to be a sandwich of two different pieces of 2x4. There's going to be a 2x4 that goes between the bottom 2x4 of the shelf and the MDF, and then one that goes on the outside from the top of the shelf to the bottom of the shelf below it. And with that vertical post installed, the final thing to do to complete these shelves is to use our Ryobi nail gun to go around and make sure we nail down the MDF on all of the shelves. <laughs> and look at that! These shelves are done! It is time to celebrate! Now just loading these shelves up with some totes before we move on to the next part of this project, which is going to be adding the pegboard, the workbench area, the three different outlets to power all of your tools, one to power the shop light and the individual light switch that's going to control the shop light. Let's get going on this next step of this awesome project. First, let's clean up some of this mess. So concerning this empty space back here, I knew I wanted to put a pegboard so I could hang tools and things like that. But I didn't know if I wanted to build in a workbench here. I could do the same thing, build a box just like we've been doing, put a tabletop on it, and I could have my own little workbench here. But then that workbench would be permanent here. I couldn't remove it if I needed to use this extra space, for example, to back in our razor. So what I did is I found two different options. Let me show you. So originally my plan was to put this toolbox in that empty area of the shelves that I had built. But I remembered my wife had a friend whose husband owned a carpentry company and they were moving so they were getting rid of a lot of stuff and just giving stuff away for free. And I had got myself a really nice, really hard, heavy duty tabletop. And I was gonna put it in the middle of the garage here on wheels and I never got around to it, but look where it fits perfectly. I can just use this as a tabletop inside my little cutout area. And I can make it so it's removable so that if I needed to store like our razor back here, our razor would still fit and make it a removable shelf. Just add some supports from the underneath side, maybe a four or two by four right here. And I could sit on this thing, it's so heavy duty. So I'm really stoked about that. Because it was my original plan to put the toolbox there, I decided to roll the toolbox back and see what it looked like and how I liked it. I mean, I like it, I think it looks great. I designed it for this purpose, for the toolbox to sit right here. But the one problem I have is that because the concrete sticks out a little bit, there's a big lip here. When I push the toolbox all the way back, there's gonna be a huge gap behind the toolbox. So unless I build some kind of apparatus that goes behind it, I'm gonna be dropping tools off this thing like crazy. So while I decide, I'm gonna just move it out of the way, put it back and move on to the next step, which is working on our power outlets. So either way, while I decide, I want to add another outlet down below. 
so that if I have a power strip behind whatever workbench I decide, that the power cord that plugs in will be out of the way and it won't come down from here and then go to the power strip. I will have this little outlet empty or open, but I also am thinking I want to add another outlet up here in case I want to hang a light right here. That light could plug into the outlet on the back wall up here and still not take up a space in that outlet. And the other idea is, well, if I do that, may as well add a switch somewhere, either here that powers this light bar or maybe hide a switch back here so it's right in front and I can just turn it on and off. Either way, I do want to add at least one outlet down here. So this is the next step I'm gonna do. Before I hang my pegboard, which I've already got right there. Let's get to it. The first step, of course, is to go turn the power off for this. I'm hoping that the outlets are on a different line than the lights because I need light, but we'll find out quick. So you have garage power there and we have garage lights here. So I'm guessing the garage power the thing I'm gonna need to do is go fast because my refrigerator, my freezer outside is plugged into those lights as well. So let's go see if that flips it. At garage 11, which is right here, it's a 20 amp breaker, which means we need, oh uh, geez, we're gonna need a cable that I don't have because we're gonna need 12 gauge wire and I only have 14. Well, let's see, at least see if this is what I'm turning off. Well, the lights are on but the freezer is off. So that's the switch I need. Let's go see if it plugs into power. Yep, nothing. So that's the switch we need to turn off. But I need a different kind of wire than I have. That's a bummer. Back to the store. So because this outlet is on a 20 amp breaker, I needed to get 12 gauge wire because 14 gauge wire will not work on a 20 amp breaker. So here's my 12 gauge wire, it's 12 by three. We only need a 12 by two in this case, we just need a white, black, and a ground. But because the 12 by three was cheaper, I decided to get it and I'm just not gonna use the third wire, but keep it just in case I do need it in the future. But we do not need a 12 by three for this project, just a 12 by two. So that I have to do hardly any opening of the walls, I'm gonna keep the outlets in line vertically with the other outlet. So I'm gonna just measure where to put them. Because I'm gonna install a pegboard, I'm gonna hold up this one by two piece of wood that's going to be the frame for the pegboard so that I can make sure that the outlet I put in goes beyond that piece of wood so that I don't run into the issues of the wood covering up the outlet or anything like that. The second outlet or the third outlet overall is going to go below the workbench area so I can power things from below as well as things from above. So one below and one above. Off screen, I went around to all the other outlets in the garage that were at that knee or shin level, and I made sure I grabbed the height of that so that this lower outlet will be on that exact same height so it matches the entire rest of the garage. In my case, the outlet is actually on the left side of the stud. You can see where the tape is, is where the stud is, but I'm just checking with my finger to hear the sound to make sure that it's hollow where I'm gonna start cutting through the drywall. Now I'm going to take the wall faceplate off of the outlet so I can see where the gang box is. I'm going to take a measurement and draw with my level a straight line from the right side of the gang box down because the right side is where the stud is. This is so that I know where I need to cut my line through the drywall is going to match the outlet above. Now I'm going to use the level to draw a straight horizontal line where I had marked the wall earlier to indicate where the height of the outlet should be. Now I'm holding up my new single gang box so I know where to trace around it and so I know exactly where to cut my holes in through the drywall so this will fit nice and snug. Taking a look at this single gang box that I've purchased is really a DIY's best friend. These flaps on the front hold it to the drywall on the front and then this flap in the back will flip up like this when you tighten down the screw. That flap in the back will pinch the drywall from the other side so the front flaps and the back flaps will hold this to the wall on the drywall. It's really fun, really easy, and I've used this so many times on so many different projects. Now I'm just starting these cuts with my little razor knife or box cutter, just so that I can get some nice straight lines through the drywall's surface. And then I'm gonna go back through with my multi-tool and I'm gonna saw this drywall out. It's gonna make it a much faster process than trying to cut this thing out with my just my razor knife. But if that's all you have, then go for it. Now with my multi-tool, I'm going really slow and I'm not trying to push too hard because I don't want this to fly through the wall and accidentally cut something behind there if there happened to be something behind there. Go slow. Now that I'm mostly through the drywall, I'm just gonna knock on this with my hand and look, it just falls right off. 
and you can see there's really not much behind it. I'm just gonna take the multi-tool and kind of clean up the edges a little bit so this is a nice perfect square. Just doing a little dry fitting and you can see it's not quite fitting so I'm just gonna hit it back with the multi-tool again until we have a nice dry fit of this gang box in the drywall. Dry fit looks great. Now we're gonna pop this off the wall so we can start running some of the wires. Now the wires that I just purchased are going to attach to this existing outlet. So I'm gonna take these screws off so I can pull it out of the gang box and examine the wires. I'm also going to test with a multimeter tool. Now that all the wires are exposed, let's talk about the wires themselves for a minute. The black wires always go to the gold screws. The white wires or the neutral wires always go to the silver screws on the other side of the outlet. And the ground wires, which are either copper or green, will go on the green terminal, which has a green screw. Now it looks like this particular outlet was wired in what's called a direct connect fashion, where the hot wires from the breaker come into the top of the outlet, the top black and the top white, and then the bottom black and the bottom white go to the next outlet in the series. But what you'll find is that's not always the case, especially with existing construction. Sometimes the hot is ran into the bottom, sometimes it's ran into the top. Technically speaking, on modern non-GFCI outlets, it doesn't really matter, but you're gonna have to use your multimeter to figure out which one is which. Often the hot goes into the top and the neutral going out to the next terminal is on the bottom. There's also another wiring method called pigtailing where you would combine all of the black wires into one wire nut, all of the whites into their own wire nut, and then the grounds would be wired together as well. And then once they're wired together, you send off a separate line from the black into the outlet and a separate white into the outlet so that this one particular outlet is pigtailed. We could half pigtail it where we only pigtail off the hot line to go to the new outlets and leave the other, the neutral lines, if you will, going off the bottom of the outlet, just keep it the way it is going to the next outlets in the series so that we don't disrupt anything that's already working. So there's benefits to both ways, but more than likely pigtailing everything would probably be the best way to go. But before we proceed, let's just go ahead and double check with the voltage detector to make sure that the power is indeed off to this outlet. Well, it's a good thing that we are testing with this voltage detector. I had forgotten that overnight I turned the breaker back on so that the items in the freezer wouldn't melt. But now that we're working on it again, we really need to make sure we turn that back off. I would highly recommend that you get one of these voltage detectors so that you can be safe and remain unelectrocuted. Now that the breaker is back off, we can pull the outlet out of the way and start to open up these little tabs at the bottom of this box so we can start to fish our wire down to the hole that we just cut for the new outlet. Just grabbing my large flathead screwdriver so I can start prying up in those tabs at the bottom of this gang box. So what I've found is that it's kind of hard to push wires out of these gang boxes. They're designed to have wires come into them and not be pulled out of the other side. So I'm having trouble pushing the wire through. So I'm gonna actually go and grab my fish tape so I can send a line down and then pull the wires back up into the box instead. So let's do that. Now, if you've seen some of my other videos, you'll know that I just love this fish tape. I've used it so many times. This is about a 40 foot spool. And what it is is a really nice thick hard wire that you can push through the walls and then you're gonna push it through the outlet and then once it's popping out the other side, we're gonna tape our wires on and pull them back up through using this fish tape. Really handy, I love this stuff. I've used it so many times. I'd highly recommend getting some. Now that we've ran our fish tape through the existing outlet into the hole where our new outlet's gonna be, at this point we're gonna tape with electrical tape the new wire onto the other end of this fish tape and then pull it right back through up into the existing gang box. Now that I have the wire coming into my existing gang box, I can just cut off the electrical tape off the fish tape and then I'm done. This fish tape is so cool, I love this stuff. Now I'm just gonna make sure I have about six inches worth of wire coming into the existing gang box and I'll do the other for the gang box below, about six inches so you have enough to do all of your wiring. Now we're going to repeat those exact same steps for the second new outlet we're going to add above the existing outlet. And remembering that this new outlet's gonna go below the frame for the pegboard, so we need to make sure we don't have any interference that way. We're just gonna cut out the rectangle out of the drywall, run our fish tape and run our wire through the holes, and do all those exact same processes until we have our third outlet ready to go. And this random YouTube people is exactly why I recommended and still recommend you go slow with your multi-tool through the drywall. Look what we found, there's two wires back here. One's obviously going down to the power outlet that we've been working with, and the other is the one that's going to the next outlet in this series. So I'm glad that we went slow with this and we didn't cut through the wire at all. So just be safe when you're doing this. 
Now that catastrophe was avoided by going slow and being safe, we're going to run our fish tape up this time from the existing outlet to this hole above, and then we're going to pull our wire back down through. And remember, we are leaving about six inches coming out of each outlet on each side. And now I'm going to go back through on each end of each line that we just ran and cut off the sheathing to expose the wires that are inside. And remember, at this point, I'm also going to cut off the red wire that we're not going to be using at all anymore. And before I cut the sheathing off the wires coming out of these holes, I need to remember to run them through the new gang boxes that we have. So let's do that first before we strip the wires. It'd be much easier to run it into the box before. And remember, as we tighten down the screws on these cool gang boxes, it's going to pull the flap on the other side to pinch this gang box to the drywall. <laughs> and what I'm doing here is just realizing how much of a moron I am. I didn't account for the height of those tabs on these gang boxes, so it's going to interfere with that piece of wood we're going to use for our pegboard. So I'm going to need to probably cut the hole a little bit bigger on the bottom side, and I'm just frustrated because I didn't think about that. So. Moving on for now to running the wires through the new gang box and cutting and stripping those as well. Amid my frustration with myself about the gang box being in the wrong place, I forgot to tilt the camera up to film me fixing that. So this is what it looks like now. So you can see I cut the hole a little wider at the bottom so I could pull the outlet down so it's beyond that line that I need for my pegboard. So there's a little gaping hole above there, but the faceplate for the outlet should cover that. But I might go back through and fill it with some kind of expanding foam or something. But I went also and I stripped the wires and gave it a little curl so that they can fit around the new outlets. I did that all off camera because I was an idiot and forgot to show this on camera. And now it's time to wire up my first new outlet. I'm going to start by connecting the ground to the ground terminal. You can see I have the hook of my wire going clockwise around the terminal screw. That's so that when I spin it righty tighty, I'm actually tightening the wire down with my spin instead of loosening it. So make sure it's going in a clockwise direction around the nut. And then I've chosen to do the bottom terminals on this particular outlet for my white and my black. So in this case, I only have one wire coming into this outlet on each of my brand new outlets. And then I'm going to wire up everything here in just a minute. Same exact thing here for our bottom new outlet. Please tighten down all screws even if it doesn't have a wire going into it. Now you may be wondering, we're on a 20 amp circuit. Can you use a 15 amp outlet? And the short answer is yes, as long as you have more than one. You cannot have a single 15 amp outlet on a 20 amp circuit. You need to have a double outlet like the one that we're using. And all of these other outlets on this entire line are already 15 amp outlets because there are more than one of them. So we are fine as long as it's not a single outlet. But again, you must use 12 gauge wire on a 20 amp breaker. With the new outlets all wired up, now it's time to wire everything up. While I was examining the wires coming into this existing outlet, I saw something that I thought was quite strange. Let me show you. If you can see the black and white coming in on the right side, the black goes to the bottom, but the white comes up to the top, actually. I would have expected it to come here, but it's coming to the top. And then this is going to the other wire, and the top black here is also going to the other wire. So it's backwards from what I would have expected. Now I'll continue to show you what I did, but I'm going to first show you a better way on what I probably am going to go back and do later on. I'm talking, of course, about pigtailing. So this example is a diagram that I found online. I couldn't find a copyright information to this, so I'm just going to show it anyways. But you can see all of the neutral wires for every single line that's coming into this box are all wire netted together. Same with the ground lines and same with the hot lines. They're all wire netted together in their own respective color. Then for each of the different colors, black, white, and ground, you'll have a wire coming out to the outlet here. So that's called pigtailing. We're going to pigtail off of this central collection of wires straight to the outlet. One pigtail for the black, one pigtail for the white, one pigtail for the green. And this will avoid the confusion of, well, which wire is the wire that's coming from the breaker? Which wire is the wire going to the next outlet in the series? If they're all pigtailed together, the power will come into this one collective space in the nut for all wires of that same color. And then you'll send the power out to the outlet and the power will continue on through the process and where it needs to go next. And it's much easier if you just pigtail, but I'll go ahead and continue to show you what I did, which is kind of a half pigtail solution. Let's just start with all the grounds. If you can see, all of the grounds come in and they are bundled together right here. 
and then this is the line that goes right into the outlet. So I need to bundle all of the ground wires together. And you can see there's this thing here that kind of connects them all together. I do have brand new one. So I'm gonna to try to cut that one off so I can use my new one because it's gonna have two more lines in it now. So let's go ahead and do that. And as feared, it's not coming off as easy as I'd hoped. It's kind of not great for DIY people using these things. Cut the tab piece off. I'm gonna leave that all connected together like so. Next, I need to take this um, ground wire off the receptacle here so I can run my new copper connector piece over the whole thing. Okay. Now making a J hook and putting it back on the receptacle. I had previously confirmed with my voltage detector that the hot lines are going into the bottom black and the top white. So I'm going to disconnect those so I can pigtail off of them. I'm leaving the other ones connected to the outlet and they will just continue on through the next set of outlets in the series, just like they are now. But really, I would recommend you just pull all of the wires off and do the pigtail option that we've discussed. But just showing you what I did do and that did work. Now with some of that extra wire that I had cut up earlier when I was making sure that I had six inches coming out of the box, I'm going to take out one of the black wires and I'm gonna use that as my pigtail wire. Just gonna strip both sides off to expose the wire. One goes into the wire nut and one goes onto the black part of the outlet. Black and white pigtail wires are now connected to the outlet. Now comes the time where I'm going to combine all of the whites together and all of the blacks together, and then this will be done. You can see I have about four wires I need to spin together, and it's really hard to do this just by hand. I have this handy little tool that's used to combine wires together and it strips them at the same time. But since they're already stripped, I'm just gonna feed them into this little tool and I'm gonna spin it so that it spins them all together. I will provide a link to this tool and all other tools that I've used in this video in the video description. Go check it out and get yourself some awesome gear. See, now doesn't that just look pretty? And here comes the wire nut. It's a little bit bigger one because there's so many wires. Last is to do the same thing for the black wires. Moment of truth. Let's go flip the breaker. Push me luck. Well, there's no fire yet, so let's check it out. Let's test these and see if we get the same results. Good. What about up here? Power. So far, so good. Down here. I think we might just have done it. Let's go check this other outlet. I see that the jellyfish lights are on and hot, hot. I mean, I think we're good, guys. Whew. Let's try plugging something in. Good. Three, two, one. Got a green light. Of course, nothing's plugged in. That's why it's flashing red. But I mean, it seems to be working. That one's off center, but. New one up here. Guys, I think we're good. Ugh. That's a weight off my shoulders. Now I just need to put this back in. I'm gonna go turn the power back off because I don't wanna to touch any live wires and get shocked. Well, you can't tell this, but I've got about 2% battery on my phone and I've plugged it into my new outlet and it's powering my phone right now for me to make this video. So. My outlets are working. Hell yeah. Now on to adding the pegboard. Adding a pegboard is really quite easy. Pretty much all we need to do is make a frame for it. So I'm gonna frame out the outside edges, top, bottom, left, right. And then we're gonna put one in the middle because this is kind of a wide space. It's about 78 inches. It needs to be off the wall so that the little hooks that go through the pegboard don't go right into the drywall. They have a space behind it to hang. So let's get to it. These are just one by two. 
pieces of wood to make the frame. I'm just gonna drill it in with typical screws. These ones are gonna to try to mount on studs along the way just to make sure that they hold up good. But the hardest part of this is going to be actually hanging the pegboard sheet. These things are quite heavy. The sheet I got is four feet by eight feet. So I need to cut the width of it down to my 78 inches. And you can see that this piece my son's holding up is that extra piece that was cut off. This particular pegboard, you can switch between white and then the other dark brown color. So I'm gonna paint the walls white eventually. So I'm gonna go with the white side. And you can see this pegboard's pretty tall too. And since I'm gonna have some kind of workbench in here or on my toolbox, it didn't make any sense to have the pegboard go beyond the bottom shelf that you see. So I'm gonna cut that off as well. Measure that and slice it with my circular saw. I'm also trying to peek through the holes to see where the outlet is because I'm gonna cut a hole for the outlet to pop through this pegboard and have the faceplate on the top of the pegboard instead of back behind it. Lining up with the bottom of those shells, I'm going to install the bottom part of this pegboard frame. Cheese. Ah. Ah. And measuring and cutting and installing the right and left frame pieces. Now with the outer edges of the frame completely installed, I know the exact dimensions that I need to cut the pegboard at. So let's go ahead and do that with our circular saw. There's always time for a mid-project cleanup. One last part of the framing area I wanted to do was hang a piece in the middle horizontally so that I could drill into that so that when you hang your tools on this pegboard, it doesn't wobble back and forth. So it's a little bit more secure if you have something in the center to hold it straight. Now just using my multi-tool and a box cutter to cut out the holes for my outlets that I measured earlier. Now I'm holding up the pegboard and having one of those awkward realizations that I need to disassemble these outlets. In order to have the outlet on the other side of the pegboard, I need to use some spacers to extend the outlet beyond the, where it is now and on the other side of the pegboard. So I need to get some spacers and I need to disassemble the outlets. I'm gonna to have to rewire this whole thing again just so that I can have the spacers on the other side of the outlet. So here I go, just disconnecting both of those outlets behind the pegboard. Now I'm just going to awkwardly hold up this pegboard as I try to secure it with some screws. Next I run the wires through those holes that I made and then add my extensions to the outlets. Here's a look at those outlet extension boxes. They attach to the existing outlet with extra long screws. The reason we use these outlet extension pieces is so that the wires aren't just dangling back there behind the pegboard. They are still contained within a plastic area that they're not going to be exposed to anything hitting the wires. New moment of truth with the outlets on the other side of the pegboard with the outlet extensions in place. Nice and solid, power's back on. Let's test it. Good, good, good. Good, oh. wow. This was a pain in the butt, but man, does it look pretty. Look at that, no ugly cutouts around the side. Just flush mounted outlets onto the pegboard. This pegboard is nice and solid. There is a bar running in here, so that eliminates some space there, but it's gonna work fine. I might drill some holes, I don't know. But I am super proud of this, the outlet pegboard, and the whole shelving unit for that matter. Let's check it out. There we go. That is pretty. So these shelves can hold a total of 43 17 gallon totes. And that doesn't include this area here, which is gonna have a toolbox or a workbench with a nice beautiful pegboard with built-in power. Now the next part is to install the shop light that'll go above the workbench area. Hello everyone. This is my new pegboard for my future workbench area which is part of my awesome shelving unit. I'm going to add a shop light above here. And what I've purchased is this smart LED shop light or workbench light. And it comes with a standard plug, as you can see. I'm trying to figure out, and I'm going to do something that's completely experimental, at least for me, is I want to make this all work off of a switch. And in order to do that, I need to be able to access the black, white, and ground wires from this cable. So 
I would need to snap it off right here and then get to the wires and then wire the light into the switch. And then I would, on the other side, going to the power or power coming into the unit, which would be right here, I would have this cable right here. And so this cable plugs into the wall and then it already has three wires, a ground, black, and a white. And then I would wire that into the switch and in theory it should just work. But I'm going to have to basically do an experiment. This was about $35. So this experiment would cost me $35 if I don't do it right. I might have to get a whole new shop light that allows you to add your own custom cables in the first place. But I like the idea of this being smart and being able to control it with my phone and other things like that. Not necessarily, or not necessary, you know, first world problems and whatnot, but hey, it could be kind of cool. Change the colors and all that stuff like that. All right, so let's get to it. I would just need to snap this off. So this is me gambling 35 bucks to see if this works. I have some 12 gauge wire here and I'm gonna use this to do some pigtails because I foresee the cables in here not being so um, thick. I see them being kind of, you know, the kind that are kind of braided rather than solid like this. So I'm gonna pigtail it where I have a solid piece and a the braided piece all wire netted together. And then that solid piece would then be the one that goes to the switch. Makes sense. So first I'm gonna work off of the power cable because if I decide to not go this route with this light, this is the portion I still need to do. So this would plug in up here and then I would staple and run the wires to wherever my switch is gonna be, either here or there. That's a little too low, so I'd probably go for high. And I have a box, but I have no way to mount it to the wall. And I don't really fancy screwing it into that post on the front side and having it pop out like that. I'd rather it be in the back there hidden. So, I mean, that would take up some shelf space. I could put it in the front and use these screws to mount it in the front. I don't know, I might have to look and see. But I'm gonna do a test just here on the floor, just to make sure. So this is the box that I would be running everything into. And then first I would wire my cable um, into here. So what's gonna happen is the way the switch is wired is the, this is the black from the power and then, or from the power source, which would be me plugging it right into the outlet. And then this just stays empty. And then this one over here on the other side would be the black that goes to the light. So this would be the black from this cable. And then the ground and the white from all cables get um, wire netted together. And that's really all you need to do. So for the ground, <clears throat> oh man, I just dropped it. For the ground, you can have the wires, um, wire, or, so the ground from here and the ground from here get wire netted together, but that still needs to be grounded somewhere. You can run a ground and go into the box or run the ground from this into the box and then run that into the box and have a ground net into the metal box here. Or I'm gonna just do a pigtail where I send off um, a ground here to the switch itself. I mean, that's kind of what it's there for. So let's wire this up and I'll show you and re-explain what I've been talking about. Well, I went for it. I cut the cable off and as you can see, there's a green and I need to figure out which ones these are, which one's the ground and which one's the quote unquote black and let's figure it out. So the middle one was wrapped in a green but the other two were not defined as white or black, so I'm not entirely sure which one is which. It's possible it may not matter as long as it's wired up correctly on the other side. Um, or I can just mix and match and see what actually works. So, uh, wish me luck. Okay, I'm holding it like this because I don't have it plugged into anything yet. So I have the black um, 12 gauge wire going to the black of the power cord. 
And then on the other black, I have it actually as a red wire. I had another one of these. I couldn't find a length of black that I had that was 12 gauge, but I have the 12 gauge and this is my other black, which goes to the, what I hope is the black for the light. And then the ground for the power cable and the ground for the light are wire nutted together and the um, yellow one over here. And that extra cable to the um, ground connects to the light switch here at the bottom. So in theory, this should work. I'm going to get some gloves because I'm going to power this in and then it's going to be able to shock me if I were to grab these terminals. So moment of truth would be that if I plug this in to my power outlet right here and I flip this on, the light should turn on and if I flip it off, the light should turn off. So let's go ahead and flip the light this way so we can see it better. And let's plug it in. But first I'm gonna put a glove on. All right, so I have the switch just here on the concrete. It's not around anything. I'm gonna go ahead and take this power cable. And the light switch is off right now. See that? And then I'm gonna take this power cable and go ahead and plug it in. And whoa, the light turned on. So, all right, maybe the switch is backwards. So that's off. All right, look at that. Light switch on and light off. How freaking cool is that? Now that we have this proof of concept working and I cut the wire here, hopefully this wire is a good length. I'm gonna go ahead and mount this up here. I need a new junction box. Um, I don't wanna use this metal one, but I might use this metal one just for now. I'd like to have one that I can um, nail into the two x four right here but I don't really want this metal one, but that's all that I have at the moment. But wow, proof of concept is that it does indeed work. Dude. Now it's time to hang the shop light. When I built these shelves, I did not necessarily measure to know exactly how wide a shop light would be or which shop light I would get. So I'm going to try my best to hang it in a way that will work and be secure and not fall off. This shop light came with some mounting equipment. I'm going to use my drill to put in some of these wall anchors that were provided so I can use these eyelet hangers to try to hang this shop light in this area. Let's see if it works. Here's a look at the little metal hanger pieces for this shop light. Let's go connect them to those little hooks and see if it looks good. Spoiler alert, it does not look good at all. It hangs down way too low. I'm gonna have to do some modifications. All right, we are almost done with this. I have my little workbench light hung under the work or above the workbench area. And you can see my pegboards installed with the power outlets. It's looking sweet. So I changed the way I was going to mount this originally. In the packaging, it comes with one of these hooks that you drill like this. But by the time the hook sat here and you hooked it into the metal clamps, the light was hanging like way down here. And one, I couldn't see this part of the pegboard and two, I was hitting my head on it when I tried to lean into the workbench area. So what I decided to do is use these clamps, they're little cable clamps, half inch, and I screwed it in up here and it hooks around the mount that, or the uh, bracket that comes with it. So it hangs a lot higher, a lot closer to the two by fours. It's looking great. So if I come over to the other side, you can see that I did the same thing with that clamp and I'm running my wire from the light with these clamps nailed into the two x four and I'm running it around and it combines with the power cable. So the power cable is close to the outlet. I'll use this top one. And this is clamped to the pegboard and it comes along and runs along this two x four here to meet up with the light cable. And they all come down into the junction box, which I have nailed to the two x four right here. So let's talk about the wiring. So concerning the wiring, I have one of these crimp sleeves for the ground. I have the two green ground wires coming in and it's crimped to a metal um, copper 
which goes to the ground area at the bottom of the switch here. Then I have the whites for both the light cable and the power cable. I'll, I'm wire netted together here on the orange one. And then my two blacks, I have the black from the light that goes to one of the terminal areas here, if you will, on the light. And then for the power cable, you can see the black coming out and it gets wire netted together and it goes onto the other side of the light down here at the main black, I'll call it a terminal. Now it should be all wired up and working great. Let's do a test. If I plug this in, in theory, I probably won't see a light, but I might. All right, I plugged it in. I don't see a light. So let's flip the switch. And success. Sweet. So the last thing to do is just to wire this up into the box. I'm gonna flip it around though, so that um, up is on and down is off. But look at that. Whew. So that's how you can cut the cable of a light and merge it with a wire to, that has a plug on the other end and wire it up into a switch. It's really pretty freaking easy. So let's get that wall plate on for the light switch and let's see what she looks like. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks for joining me on my journey in building my freaking awesome storage shelves. I've got a built-in workbench table, a pegboard, a built-in light, a light that's powered by a simple light switch, and I've got plenty of room to spare. This shelving unit can store 43 of these 17 gallon storage boxes. So how freaking cool is that? I've got room for my decorations, I've got room for my tools, I've got room for baby clothes, everything you can think of. And I've got room to spare underneath. Come on, what more could you want? I'll post the designs for this in the link in the comments. Thank you for joining me, and remember to subscribe. Subscribe. I'd like to give a special shout out to my dad for helping me calculate the amount of wood that we were going to need for this project and assembling the shelves. In my family, everybody calls him the master shelf builder. I wouldn't be the DIY guy I am today without him. Love you, Dad. Looks good.